The Zeitgeist movement is not a political movement. It does not recognize divisionary notions such as nations, governments, races, religions, creeds, or class. Rather, we see the world as one organism, with the human species as a singular family. Simultaneously, we acknowledge that we depend entirely on our environment, not only in regard to the necessities of life, such as food, air, and water, but also for influence and guidance in regard to life's processes. We recognize and understand that aligning ourselves with natural processes is the most progressive and productive disposition we can have. The Zeitgeist Movement, in fact, is the activist arm of the Venus Project, an organization which constitutes the lifelong work of industrial designer and social engineer Jacques Fresco. Simply put, what the Venus Project represents and what the Zeitgeist Movement hence condones could be summarized as the application of the scientific method for social concern. One of the greatest discoveries of humankind, which has allowed for tremendous advancement in our abilities on this planet, has been the understanding and application of science. Through the humane application of science and technology to social design and decision making, we have the means to transform our environment into something exceedingly more balanced, organized, humane, productive, and most importantly, sustainable. As many are aware at this time, both our societal integrity and ecological integrity are in serious question. The current economic system is falling apart at an accelerating rate, with the prospect of worldwide unemployment and destabilization occurring possibly on the largest scale ever seen. Simultaneously, we are courting the point of no return in regard to the destruction of the environment. Given the current state of affairs, many of which will be addressed in the first part of this presentation, the viewer should find that we not only need to move in another direction, we have to. In order to understand where we are and how we have gotten to this point in history, we need to address those societal attributes which have greatly affected our social conduct. The most important observation in this regard is our use of a monetary system. In this section, we are going to address the mechanisms of our world monetary system, pointing out the consequences this type of organizational structure has produced. These consequences include, one, the need for cyclical consumption, denoting the economic requirement that products and services are perpetually bought and sold regardless of quality and waste. Two, the abundance of scarcity, denoting how resources, goods, and services are deliberately made scarce to ensure profitability within the supply and demand equation. Three, the priority of profit, denoting the vast corruption commonplace in the world due to the need to generate income. Four, fiscal manipulation, denoting how the central banking systems of the world work to control the economy for the benefit of their corporate constituents and establishment power. One, the need for cyclical consumption. The roles of people in a monetary system are basically broken into three distinctions. The employee, the employer, and the consumer. The employee performs tasks for the employer in exchange for a wage or monetary payment, while the employer sells a good or service to the consumer for a profit, another classification of monetary payment. In turn, both the employer and the employee function as consumers, for the monetary payments they obtain are used to purchase goods and services relevant to their survival. This act of purchasing goods and services is what allows the entire system to perpetuate, thus allowing for the employer and employee to make money and thus continue consuming. In other words, it is the requirement of perpetual or cyclical consumption that keeps the entire economy going. If consumption was ever to stop, the whole system would collapse. This produces two severe consequences for society. One, Nothing physically produced can ever maintain a lifespan longer than what can be endured in order to maintain the needed cyclical consumption. In other words, everything must break down in a respective amount of time in order to continue the financial circulation needed to power the economy. This characteristic could be defined as planned obsolescence. Planned obsolescence is essentially the deliberate withholding of efficiency, so the product in question breaks down respectively fast. This happens both intentionally, with manufacturers timing their products for breakdown, often as soon as the warranty runs out, and indirectly, where profit-based shortcuts taken in production, usually in the form of cheap materials and poor design, translates into an inferior product immediately, with the failure of the product simply a matter of time. The second consequence is that new products and services must be constantly introduced regardless of functional utility, generating endless waste. The result of these two issues are nothing but unacceptable, for not only are resources being neglectfully used in products that are designed not to last, wasting human energy and materials, the amount of frivolous waste and pollution that results is staggering. 
In other words, waste is a deliberate byproduct of industry's need to keep cyclical consumption going. The obsolete or expired product is trashed, often to landfills, polluting the environment, while the constant multiplicity accelerates this pollution. To express this from a different angle, imagine the economic ramifications of production methods that strategically maximize the efficiency and sustainability of every product, using the best known materials and techniques available at the time. Imagine products so well designed that they didn't need maintenance for, say, a hundred years. Imagine a house that was built from fireproof materials where all appliances, electrical operations, plumbing, and the like were made from the most impermeable, highest integrity resources available on Earth. In such a saner world, where we actually created things to last, minimizing pollution and waste, a monetary system would be impossible. For cyclical consumption would slow tremendously, forever weakening so-called economic growth. Mechanism 2. The Abundance of Scarcity in monetary economics, supply and demand is partly how goods and services obtain value. The more there is of something, the less it is worth in respect to itself. If we woke up one day and, for some reason, hypothetically speaking, there were only a hundred oranges left in existence with no possibility to grow more, the value of those oranges would skyrocket, for they are now extremely scarce. In other words, it is profitable for resources to be scarce. If a company can convince the public that their product is rare, the more they can charge for that product. This provides a strong motivation to keep items and resources scarce. The ramifications of this are psychologically profound, for if companies know they can make more money by having their items scarce, the propensity to deliberately limit production or be dishonest about available resources is high. This means that the monetary system rewards mechanisms that inherently discourage abundance and equality. Even more offensively, profit can actually be made as a result of scarcity generated by environmental pollution, such as what is now happening with our water supplies. This creates a perverse reinforcement of indifference to environmental concern by industry, for the more damage there is, the more profit that can be obtained by offering solutions. And this leads us to three, the priority of profit. A monetary system's foremost motivating principle is profit, or more generally, income. All people must seek out a strategy to acquire money. A wage earner seeks out the best possible pay he can get for his services, while the employer seeks to constantly reduce costs in order to maximize their profit. This competitive mentality extends into all facets of society, and it should be no surprise that those who are in positions of great wealth are often the most ruthless and indifferent. Now, before we move any further into the negative consequences of the profit priority, let's first consider what many think to be the good side of this system, incentive. As the theory goes, the need for profit provides a person or organization with motivation to work on new ideas and products that might sell in the marketplace. In other words, the assumption is that if people were not motivated by their need to obtain money, nothing would be invented and little social progress would be achieved. First of all, the most powerful contributions to society did not come from people seeking profit. Louis Pasteur, Charles Darwin, the Wright brothers, Albert Einstein, and Isaac Newton did not make their massive contributions to society because of material self-interest. While it is true that useful inventions and methods do come from the motivation for personal gain, the intent behind those creations typically have nothing to do with human or social concerns, and everything to do with detached self-interest and blind personal gain. The pursuit of profit almost always comes before human concern, and a simple glance at the cancer-causing preservatives in our foods, the planned obsolescence of nearly everything manufactured, along with a healthcare industry that charges $300 for a single antibiotic pill, will indicate that the profit incentive is actually a detriment. Problems in our monetary-based society will only have resolution if money can be made from solving those problems. Now, more specifically, to put the spectrum of monetary-derived corruption into a workable perspective, we will divide these behaviors into three classifications, general crime, corporate crime, and government crime. General crime in a monetary system ranges from petty theft to illegal sales to fraud to violent robbery. This by 